So I'm, I'm John Bellamerick from Google. This is Yang Tang uh, from Avanti. And uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about how uh, you may or may not realize you're leaking some of your service information uh, in your Kubernetes clusters and, and what you might be able to do about it. So Yang will take over from here. OK, to, to get started, before we talk about uh, Kubernetes service information and the DNS, let's uh, just briefly reveal role-based access control in Kubernetes. So what is role-based access control? Role-based access control is to define uh, which user can do what in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the principles of uh, RBAC is to have a list of privilege. That means you only want to expose information to users that absolutely need to know. Uh, the good thing about the role-based access control in Kubernetes is that it avoids interference in a shared environment. Let's assume you have a shared cluster with several teams. Each team has their own agenda, has their own like uh, features, has their own service to maintain. And uh, uh, let's say someday some one team decided to make some deployment and it break up certain things and uh, cause the whole cluster in a uh, in a non-working state, then every team will suffer, right? That's the so-called shared environment. But in role-based access control, you actually want to have a separation. So if one team messed up, it will not uh, cause a trouble to another team. Uh, role-based access control has been available in Kubernetes uh, since 1.8. So it has been adopted by, uh, by many companies uh, across the board. However, uh, in today's session, I'm going to discuss a little bit about uh, a special information that is uh, DNS-related uh, information. Uh, the uniqueness about DNS is that uh, DNS is actually an uh, outlier in Kubernetes environment. So how is that? So first of all, DNS information in Kubernetes is always going to be public. That is, uh, DNS by itself serves as an entry point for all the services because it serves the purpose of service discovery. The services in Kubernetes uh, will be exposed to our clients through DNS. DNS, uh, have a, DNS relies on UDP protocol, which makes things even worse, because with UDP, you have no authentication or authorization. Uh, this is in great conflict with the least privileged principle we discussed just moments ago. So you have to fix that. Uh, so how do you fix that? There are several ways to fix, and depending on your scenario, there may be some very easy way to fix. Let's just uh, hypothetically say you work for a small startup. You have some great product you try to push, and uh, because it's a small startup, the growth, uh, uh, the growth of the company is uh, very high, let's say 50% year over year, or even more. And in this case, your company's uh, higher level management uh, are going to push for new features every day, they care more about the, the growth, they care less about the cost or security. And uh, because of that, normally the company will operate it in, in a way such that you have uh, smaller teams, and each team working on their own, pushing features every day constantly. That's a so-called fast deployment. Uh, in, in a scenario like that, you're going to say, can we find an easy way to avoid the, the noisy, evil neighbor situation we discussed just a moment ago? Uh, of course, they have some there are some easy ways. We talk about uh, shared information. We don't want the information to be shared with each other. We also want to, uh, to avoid a scenario where one team's uh, trouble causes another team. Then let's just say, let's give every team a standalone coordinate cluster. Well, the problem is solved, right? You're going to say, this solution seems to be a little dummy, right? <laughs> but the reality is, uh, at, at least from my experience, when I talk to different companies uh, across the board, I talk to different uh, uh, teams across different companies, and many companies actually operating this way. Uh, that is because if you have a company with, let's say, several hundred engineers, and you have, let's say, like uh, 10 teams or 20 teams, each team only have like uh, 10 or 20 people, uh, you don't have a dedicated team. You Every team just work on their own. They just want to say, okay, so they don't want to share environment with another team because it's causing a lot more trouble to communicate with so many teams. Uh, it's causing a lot of trouble to do all kinds of things. Besides, you know, I'm working on my own. I'm trying to push as, as soon as possible. So I want a dedicated cluster so, you know, so I can release whenever I want. That's a smaller company with a hyper growth. Uh, and the problem is solved if you just give everyone 
uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, what, what, by the way, one thing I want to mention is that uh, we all know Kubernetes can have a very big cluster. Uh, on top of uh, the, you know, the biggest cluster you can handle in Kubernetes environment, it's like uh, 5,000 nodes. But on average, when I talk to different companies, for a company less than 1,000 uh, employees, most of the clusters are ranging from, let's say, five nodes all the way to maybe like 20 nodes. So that's not a big cluster, right? So that's, that's the scenario we encounter with smaller companies. But now we talk about uh, what, what about if we all work for a company that's uh, getting a little bigger and uh, the growth has been slowed down. When the growth of a company slows down, you realize the shared environment became a necessity. There are several reasons. One, the management, your, your company's management, is pushing for profit versus the growth because there's no, no real growth anymore. And the few features will be released less frequently uh, as expected. And finally, uh, if you work for a team and you have been maintaining this uh, service for a long time, you probably already adopt a mindset of say, if it's working, don't change it. No one wants to make a change, <laughs> Okay, now we talk about the shared clusters and talk about a dedicated, dedicated team. That's all great, because with a dedicated team, with a shared cluster, there are several advantages. One, it increases CPU, uh, CPU memory and GPU utilization. Two, you can update Kubernetes clusters infrastructure more, fre uh, more frequently. Uh, this is going to increase the security coverage. And uh, because you have one dedicated team to do all the upgrade, you are going to uh, have less uh, cross-team coordinations. One issue I observe uh, with the so-called uh, distributed mode of uh, each, uh, each team have one cluster is that every team try to work on their own. They are getting excited at the beginning of the development cycle, but when a uh, service getting into a maintenance mode and you need to uh, release a security update, you realize that even just by sending notice to let's say 20 teams or 30 teams, you're telling them, hey, there's a, a Kubernetes version that's getting a little uh, old and we had to upgrade to a new version. It's getting very troublesome because every team has a, their own uh, schedule their own agenda. They don't want to be disrupted by someone saying, you have to stop whatever you are doing and you have to upgrade, right? So in this way, if you have a dedicated, uh, dedicated team to maintain shared environment, uh, your company normally have a, uh, have a better efficiency across the board. Now, that's a question we are going to ask. If you are the class admin and you work for this dedicated team, you, man you maintain, let's say, 200 Kubernetes cluster, or maybe just maintaining one gigantic Kubernetes cluster with, let's say, 1,000 node. So how are you going to fix the Kubernetes DNS information leakage issue? I'm going to hand over to Jiang, and he will do the magic here. Yeah. Thank you, Yang. Thank you, Yang. Um, OK, so let's, I'm going to do a little demo. So we'll see actually how this problem, um, how bad this problem is. Uh, OK, so I have, oops. Uh, notice here. Um, what I have here is uh, a kind cluster running. Um, so we can see uh, it's got some stuff running in it. Sorry. Um, okay, there's a bunch of services running in it. And um, so, you, you, you know, we can launch a pod. And what we see here is that that pod, because it's, I didn't give it any particular service account or anything, it's going to get the default service account in the default namespace. And that is going to, we have our back, of course, on our cluster. And so we can see um, that we have no access to anything. So the, the, the scenario here is, right, you have a, a, a shared cluster with, uh, as Yang was saying, you know, as your company grows, you may want to create shared multi-tenant clusters. Um, you have uh, users with access to that cluster. They can create pods. They can do, do what they will. But of course, they have their, their access scoped to um, whatever their particular RBAC is. And uh, typically, that's to specific namespaces. So here we've got a pod that's just 
has basically no privileges to the API, but um, even so, uh, you know, it does have privileges to query DNS. So you can actually use that to glean information. So in the Kubernetes DNS specification, because it's sort of coming from the DNS world, it, um, it represents the, the services as this DNS schema, and it will respond based upon um, things like if a namespace exists, you'll get uh, a new query for a record in that namespace. That means that the, the DNS name for that namespace exists, and so there may not be a record. So I'm going to query for just a, a, a record that is a record for an IP address that matches a namespace name that doesn't exist. Um, and you'll see that I get doesn't exist, but if I get if I query for one that does exist, oops, sorry, I've, it definitely doesn't exist when it's completely wrong. Um, still doesn't exist. And then if I query for one that does, we know cube system exists. All right, I get no error. I get no. I I get no records. So it's a non-error. I don't get the NX domain saying that there's no such domain. So what this is telling me is it's leaking a little bit of information that if I can guess a namespace name, I can determine whether even though I have zero privileges on the actual API server, I can determine whether that namespace exists. Okay, that's that's kind of interesting. But guessing a bunch of namespace names isn't really that easy to do. But if I think about it. I know I can probably use that to look up this, the API server itself, and I can see, well, that's, uh, that's got IP address 1096.0.1. You know what? Uh, that means that the service cider is probably 1096/16. So there's another thing that DNS can look up. It can do reverse IP lookups. So if I know the, the, the cider, I know the addresses. I can do a bunch of reverse lookups. So, you know, a slash 16 really isn't all that big these days. I can actually take this stupid script, 10 lines of bash code, not even bash, shell, um, and uh, I can look through that whole slash 16 and do reverse lookups. So let's give it a try. Oh, okay, found two things in, in, uh, in the, first uh, slash 24, and it's going to go through, and it takes about six seconds with this stupid little bash script for each slash 24, so that's about 20 minutes. I don't want to sit around here and wait 20 minutes, so we're going to cheat just a little bit, because I happen to know something that the attacker wouldn't know, and that's that um, I can look here, and I can just start at, say, uh, this particular slash 24, and we can try that again, and let's see what we find. Okay, so it's scanning, and oh, look at that. Okay, so I have a service running here. Um, Gitty, Gitty is a open source Git provider like GitLab or GitHub. It's a sort of open source clone of GitHub, um, and so I can see now, even though I I don't have any privileges to the API server, I can see that exists. Well, I can actually go and I can query for an SRV record. So an SRV record in DNS is uh, not just an IP address that it returns, but it also returns a port. So every service that you publish in the Kubernetes API server, you typically will say what the ports are for that service, and those end up in an SRV record. So if I do that, SVC.cluster.local. I don't actually have to type all of it out, I guess, but um, we can see, okay, it's got port uh, 22 running. That's for Git SSH service and port 3000. I wonder what that is. Well, I know that Git tends to run HTTP, so if maybe I can just try and do a little of this. Um, Cluster.local. Port 3000, and oh, look at that. So here I am. Uh, I can start to explore uh, all of my other tenants 
uh, services, what they have running, and I can start poking at them and looking for ones that have vulnerabilities, and then, of course, I can crack into those. So we've leaked some information that can be useful to attackers through DNS. Um, so what can we do about that? How can we reduce the leakage? Well, um, in, sorry, I'm checking my notes here. So um, we have a feature in Core DNS. It's not built in, but it's called the firewall plugin. And um, I can switch back to the slides. Um, it's an external plugin, and it's available, but it's part of the Core DNS organization, which means we maintain it as part of Core DNS. Um, but when it's an external plugin, that means that the one that you're downloading off of, uh, that it's running in your EKS cluster, the Core DNS, or your AKS cluster, or your uh, Google GKE on-prem cluster, um, or I don't know uh, if OpenShift uh, runs Core DNS uh, or not. I think they do, but I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, the one that's running there by default, yeah, okay, and uh, is, is not going to have this in it, so you'd have to build your own custom image. But basically what it does is uh, it's, a, it's got a built-in expression engine uh, that allows you to write simple expressions that look like uh, a little like C, um, and it, you can also alternatively integrate with external engines like uh, OPA, but it allows... Um, you to kind of uh, make policy decisions on, the, on the, the requests that come in based upon metadata that we can associate with the individual request. So in, the, um, in, in Core DNS, we have another plugin called Metadata that is built in. And when you enable the Metadata plugin, it essentially tells other plugins, hey, add information to the context. So stepping back maybe a little bit, I, I didn't explain. Um, the way Core DNS works, different from most DNS servers, is that uh, it's a bunch of, it's a request processing pipeline. So you get a, a DNS query in, and it's accepted by Core DNS, and based on your configuration, it hands it to a plugin, which will either look up the information in some data source to satisfy that query, or we'll manipulate or change the query in some way, um, and it, or it will decide it doesn't have anything to do with that query, and it'll pass it on to the next plugin in the chain. So you have this whole chain of plugins. Metadata is one of these that doesn't actually do anything to the query. All it does is basically create an entry in the Go context. So in, in the programming language of Go, there's a a context that we typically whoop, pass down from one, you know, down through a chain like this. And that entry in the Go context tells the other plugins, hey, somebody's interested in metadata. The reason we do that, the reason you have to enable the metadata plugin is that, it, of course, this has a performance cost. And in DNS, it's a very, very hot loop. We want, we want tens of thousands of QPS and so, uh, on a, from a single, single core. So anything going into that that isn't needed, we, we, we try to avoid. So in any case, um, if you enable the metadata plugin, then when your request comes in, on this diagram you see the request coming in from the left top there. Uh, it's from a particular client IP. Um, it's for an SRV record for some, some query name. The metadata plugin doesn't change the actual uh, request at all. It just sort of adds this metadata placeholder for the context. The firewall plugin on the way in doesn't actually do anything because uh, of how we've configured it. But the Kubernetes plugin gets that request and says, ah, okay, that's for a cluster.local zone. So I own this query, so I'm going to resolve it. And it goes and it query, it actually has a cache of the services. It finds that in the, the cache. But it sees that the metadata plugin is enabled, and so it actually adds a bunch of metadata on that request context. Now, this is a chain, a function call chain. Right? So dun, 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 dun. on the way back, every single, uh, every single function plugin sees the, re the response on the way back, what the previous plugin did. So that request that now has the response, it's an A, uh, I guess I asked for an SRV and I'm giving an A record, so my, my slide isn't 
perfect here. But the response here is an A record. Um, the, but it also has some metadata on it. The firewall now can take advantage of that. So we can write a firewall rule within the core DNS uh, configuration that says, hey, the client namespace does not match the namespace of the service being requested. So send an NX domain instead of sending uh, the actual response. So that is actually what we'll, I'll show the configuration and I'll, I'll show that demo uh, in a moment, or just now actually. So let's take another look here. Um, so I exited out of that pod and I have here uh, a couple of files. So if I, you can see that here, if we look, whoops. If we look, this, this is, I just pulled out the deployment file. This is, you can see, a special build, right? We're not, not using the standard Core DNS default build because it doesn't include a plug-in firewall. I had to make a special build for it. And then I just pulled out the config map that's used to configure Core DNS in this kind cluster, and then I edited it, and so we can see that there we go. Um, OK, so what did I change? One, I enabled the metadata plugin. Two, I switched to pods verified mode. I'll explain that in a minute. And three, I added this stanza for configuring the, the firewall uh, policy. So uh, the, basically, it's saying allow this query if the Kubernetes namespace equals the client namespace, or I'm querying for something in cube system, or I'm querying for something in the default namespace, um, otherwise block it. All right, let's give it a try. We have to first uh, apply that change. Okay, that updates the, uh, the, the config map. And then just to be, make it faster, so Core, Core DNS will actually reload the, the core file on its own, um, but it's kind of, whether it gets to each instance is a little bit, um, you know, it, it, there can be race conditions, let's just say that. Um, and then so let's make sure that those uh, those pods restarted. Okay, 19 seconds ago. So those are restarted. So let's do our uh, example again. And let's try and grab. Oh, yeah, we, we can do it at SRV again. If I spell it wrong, it's definitely going to. Okay. And boom, an extra name. So hey, it actually works. Amazing. <laughs> All right. So, um, all right, that's interesting. Now, I mentioned uh, a moment ago, sorry, I just can scroll my notes here. Um, I mentioned I had to enable pods verified mode. So let, let's talk a little bit. Let's go back to the slide deck. Um, so, you know, it works, it's great, right? Why don't we just enable this? Why, why do I have to build a special core DNS and, and then why do I have to, to uh, you know, edit the standard DNS core file that's in every single cluster out there in, in, in the world? And, um, and there's a few reasons. One is, um, the reason I need a special build is because that firewall plugin brings a whole bunch of dependencies with it that we didn't want in the main application because it's a kind of special use case. So that's why we, we keep, it, keep it out and we don't build it in by default. But more to the point, why don't, we, why don't we build it? Why isn't it so important that we do it all by default? Well, one is you need to use pods verified mode. So what pods verified mode does in the Kubernetes plugin is um, in the earliest days of Kubernetes, there's a, a, a feature where you could request um, uh, an IP address like 10.10.10.10.pod.cluster.local uh, .10 .10 .10 .10 .10 or something like that, and it would return 10.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10 .10. But it actually would return whatever 
you put for that IP address. It just always returned it because, um, because they didn't want to watch pods. So watching pods, if you imagine um, the way the Kubernetes API server works is right, you have a, a, a way to say CordeNS works with it and, and all other controllers is they create a persistent connection to the API server and they say, I'm interested in this information, send me, any, send me all that information and then send me any changes about that information. So in a 10,000 node cluster with many, many, many tens of thousands of nodes, um, or rather many, many tens of thousands of pods, uh, a watch on pods is extremely expensive. You're pulling all of those pods into memory and then every single change of any pod that runs anywhere in the system basically gets pushed down to your process. So pods verified mode allows those pod queries. So the default in there that we changed it from was pods insecure, which basically replicates the ancient behavior. The default, which is with no pods in there, is just don't support pod names. And that's actually what most people do nowadays, I think. But in any case, Pods Verified was put in to say, hey, that's actually really insecure to just return from DNS any name because DNS is often used as like a, 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 tr a root trust type of thing. So like in your TLS negotiation, if you can effectively spoof that you have a DS name, you can probably pl play some tricks. So we were like, we don't, we don't want to do that. We added this Pods Verified mode, puts a watch on pods, only returns the pod uh, IP address if there's actually a pod with that IP. So um, that has terrible implications in large clusters. This is one of the reasons this is non-default. There's also a, a more subtle issue, and that's that the, there's a race condition. So remember, CordeNS, connection to API server, listening for things on pods, you launch a new pod. The notification of that new pod to CordeNS is an asynchronous process. So if you've got a pod that launches and immediately starts trying to make connections outbound and make DNS queries outbound, and you've implemented what I've shown you here today, then those pods will initially fail those DNS lookups. So you'll actually get application failures until CoreDNS receives the watch event, processes it, and puts it in its cache. So if your workloads are finicky and don't, don't handle uh, a failure of DNS resolution very well, then this solution wouldn't work for you there either. So two big reasons why this isn't on everywhere all the time. So, or you, I guess I have a note here. You can solve that last one by failing open, but which means like in our policies that we write in the firewall, allow unknown clients to access anything, but that's kind of, what's the point? So what in the world do we do about it? Well, I'm not gonna leave you here. I will say there is one thing you could do slightly better and that's per-tenant DNS services. And I just need to check time here. Yeah, lots of time, I think. Um, so the, the idea here is you combine some of this firewall concepts that we've talked about today, but you also segregate your DNS instances per tenant. This only works if you have sort of large tenants and say, that, that are going to be creating a lot of namespaces maybe, and you can prefix those namespaces with the tenant name, or you know, there's, there's work you have to do to make this happen, but the idea would be you combine a, with a mutating webhook so that you see when somebody's creating a pod in a namespace that uh, is, belongs to one of these tenants, you mutate their DNS policy on the pod, so you change the DNS resolver address that they're going to use for those pods, and of course, you have to run a separate CordeNS instance whose scope is limited to the namespaces of that tenant. So within the Kubernetes plugin in CordeNS, you can list a set of namespaces, and then we will only serve records for those namespaces. So that works for the tenant, as long as the tenant doesn't need to access any common services. If they do, you need to write policies to sort of allow that. Um, typically, you'll also still need to run your central DNS for all your, your platform services, which aren't tenant services. Um, and so, you know, you, you have to craft those policies, maybe to only allow lookup of the, the Cube API server. Typically, you know, a, a, and other specific platform services you want those tenants to see out of the central DNS, uh, and, um, or even use network policy potentially to limit 
visibility uh, to the central DNS for the, uh, the tenant pods. So um, that's what I've got for you. Any, any questions? There's two mics here and here if you need them. <laughs>